Hello, this is James Nochty. And here's a programme from the Book Club Archive, first broadcast in 1999. Welcome to Book Club and to a writer whose 11 novels have all been bestsellers, someone who's managed to bridge that sometimes troublesome divide between what's known as serious fiction and the popular book. So Margaret Atwood is a most welcome guest to talk with a group of readers here about her novel Cat's Eye. I hope you've been reading it at home and that you'll feel part of our circle here in Broadcasting House. Later, of course, I'll be sending you off with next month's book. Cat's Eye is a story about families and friendship, and it's also a story about time, because it's driven by memories, sudden recollections and the powerful forces of long-forgotten childhood crises. Elaine Risley, a painter, tells the story of her psychological and physical tussle with her friend Cordelia when they're children. It is a struggle for power, for dominance, and it pulls in their families who inflict lasting wounds on the friends. Margaret Atwood, welcome indeed. Can I ask you the most obvious question about the book, but it seems to me to be a very pertinent question about a book that is so gripping in so many ways. What, in the end, do you think Cat's Eye is about? Well, if I have to choose one, I'd probably say it's about little girls are not made of sugar and spice and everything nice. Uh, Some of us may have suspected this long ago, but you don't often find it in books. Even in books for written for little girls, you usually have the best friend and then the worst enemy. But in real life, these are often the same person. Did you toy with the idea of making the ending happier? No. <laughs> no, it wouldn't have been good. It wouldn't have been, been actually. It wouldn't have been accurate. Did you wonder how readers would feel at the end? Was that in your mind, or did this simply feel to you to be the natural way of coming to the the sort of balance sheet in the emotions, very painful emotions that are, are, are sort of gone through in the book? Well, as Leon Adele, who is the biographer of Henry James, said. If it's a novel, there's a clock in it. In other words, all novels have to do with time and and the passing of time. And this one begins with time, and then it ends with time. And part of what you're doing when you're telling yourself the story of your life is you're coming to terms with time. And what I remember is my great aunt, who was, by the end of her life, very old, and she uh, she was blind, and she was bedridden. And she was a very nice lady and people went to her and said you know what do you do all day (laughs) in this bed you can't see you can't read she said well I am telling myself the story of my life and when I get to the end I will close the book and I think we do this ourselves at various points in our in our lives except that the story is different in other words you're retrospective when you're looking back over your life and you're 20 Things are going to look quite different from the way they look when you're 30, when you're 40, when you're 50, and when you're 60. You know, I've finally gotten around to forgiving a a few people that I uh, held things against for some time. (laughs) So I think you do this throughout your life, and this is one point at which Elaine is doing this. And I assume she's now resolved some of her past history with Cordelia, and she can get on with something else. Let me bring people in here, because I think the before perhaps we plunge into the question of the characters involved, which, you know, fascinating, gripping characters and very deep characters, this whole question of time, the structure, the way the book is organised, as we know, is that it it moves not in a linear fashion, but it, it takes you back, it takes you forward, sometimes quite slowly, sometimes quite fast. It made me think about novels condensing time. Because, of course, she has to think back through a long time to remember what happened, and we only have to remember back 100 pages. So we get sort of privileged access, don't we, to her life? Do you feel privileged to know a great deal about her life? You can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was an amazing book, because I thought... I, it, it reminded me so much of my own life, and I'm not Canadian and I don't work as an artist, but it, the detail is so powerful. Did it ever occur to you to make Elaine into a different sort of artist, a musician or a writer, which might have been a more obvious choice? Yes, maybe it did occur, but one of my unlived lives is, is as a visual artist, so I, I, I suppose I was acting out. Let's talk about Elaine, who is the narrator in the book, and who takes us back to these painful 
tussles, as I said, some psychological but some physical. I mean, she was buried, sort of buried alive in a dark hole um, as a child. What, what do people feel about Elaine? Let's talk about nasty little girls. <laughs> you would be amazed at the letters I got on this. People had had much worse things done to them, and they weren't all girls either. Some of them were boys. Uh, astounding things. In fact, I wish I had had the letters first. Do you think that there is a fundamental difference between the ways in which girls and boys bully each other? Yes. You can back me up or not on this, but it seems to me that the structures of the little boy societies are more hierarchical and more stable and more based on observable external things, such as who is good at football or who has the biggest stamp collection or something like that, whereas the girls, their allegiances tend to shift around a lot and not be based on anything you could necessarily point out. It's not the biggest, it's not the prettiest, it's not the smartest. You, you just don't know, and, and all of a sudden, the person who was number one on Wednesday, the others will have all got together behind her back and decided they're going to demote her. And you never know quite what that is based on. Is it as if the structure provides some sort of security for the boys and the girls don't well, have Well, I don't think it provides security for the boy at the bottom of it. <laughs> so in one way it's more stable, but in, in another way it can be less hopeful if you're stuck in a, a fairly low position on the pecking order. Do you think boys are allowed to be unconventional more than girls? I don't think they're necessarily unconventional. I think they're, they're more likely to be physical. They will have it out in a, in a physical way, you know, a lot of pushing and shoving and fights on the... Maybe this doesn't go on anymore. But one thing I have noticed from reading the, the newspaper is that this is now getting more into girls' behavior than it used to. And there's more physicality and more... So, some quite violent things you read about in in the newspaper, which may have always been there and just not revealed. The whole issue of blame and victims blaming themselves seems really important in the novel, uh, you know, even with the death of Stephen, really. Elaine seems to spend her whole life thinking, it's my fault, you know, it serves her right, is the phrase that keeps coming up. Uh, what was it about her? Well, I wouldn't say her whole life at all. In fact, there's a switchover when they hit adolescence. Uh, and she becomes actually the more dominant figure. She's able to get round Cordelia in in quite a vicious way, in point of fact. She gets her own back. So I, I don't think it's... Um, she still feels there's something very wrong with her, though, doesn't she? She you know, she blames Well, it. judging from the mail one receives <laughs> yeah. and also the articles one has read, these kinds of experiences in childhood do make a lasting impression. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, people chose the Freudian point of view. Everything is determined by the time you're five. Well, that's been thrown out the window. We always knew it was wrong anyway. And people are taking a much harder look at, quotes, peer groups and the children that you know who are your age and who either you do terrible things to them or they do terrible things to you. I've met a zillion people who said I was Elaine. I've only met two who ever said I was Cordelia. There's a discrepancy there somewhere. We all forget the awful things we've done. The casual observer might have wondered, given your obvious sympathy for your female characters and, and for women in general in your feminism, uh, how that squares with the, the very malign, nasty, unpleasant uh, aspects, of, uh, particularly of Cordelia, uh, that you show so so clearly and compellingly. How do you reconcile those that that un, that unpleasant portrayal with the the feminist aspect? With the feminist aspect that everybody ascribes to me and nobody ever defines. Well, <laughs> that's perhaps what I wanted to get at. Okay, my interest as a writer is in characters of either sex or any gender who are fully rounded human beings. And one thing that was done to women repeatedly and still gets done to them in the 19th century is that they were divided into angels on the one hand and whores on the other. And you had to be one or the other, but you couldn't be a human being. You know, that middle ground was occupied by, by men. And as far as I'm concerned, women are human beings, and some of them are very nice and some of them aren't, and some of them are nice sometimes and not on Wednesdays and some of them are nice in relation to some people in their lives and not in relation to others, just like real people. 
So I think my interest as a writer is is in people who function the way people actually function in real life and not in, sh- in showing women as perfect or angels or better or wonderful or always right. I thought Elaine's second husband, Ben, and also Elaine's children are quite shadowy, and I assume that was for a purpose. Is it because of the balance of the book? or well, The book isn't about them. I think they're there to show that, yes, she does have a real life, uh, and she has gotten as far away from her, her past as she possibly can. She's gone to the west coast of Canada, which is very far away from, from Toronto. And there she has a life, but it can never be a fully filled-in life, I guess. You could call it that. Is it a compromised life, do you think? Well, I think it's, it's real in its own terms. It's just not totally multidimensional. So has she sold out when she married Ben? No, I don't think she sold out at all. I think that people make choices in adult life that are perfectly reasonable and perfectly viable and perfectly fine. They don't have the intensity of of things that happen in childhood because unless you happen to be caught in a war or something like that, things that happen to you as an adult often don't have the intensity of childhood because childhood is extremely intense. It's the first time for everything. You have no experience, you've got nothing to fall back on, and you're surrounded by giants. It's difficult. That actually maybe explains a question that we had. She says it's much easier to forgive men than women, and we wondered why. Is it because she was tougher when they hurt her? I think men find it easier to forgive women. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I, I think the reason for that is that if it's somebody like you, you expect more of them. Stephen pops into my mind at this point, and the brother who dies, the scientist. I I mean, how does he fit into the mosaic? I found Stephen. um, I was able to compare him very ably to my own brother. Um, Some people have said that uh, he wasn't well-defined, and yet the relationship that Elaine had with her brother was identical to the one I had with mine, and I found him to be a wonderful character, as I did the father as well, because Dad was there, but not there. Do you think that her life would have been different if she'd had a sister? I think her life would have been very different if she'd had a sister. I think one of her her problems with these little girls is she's never been around other little girls. Mm -hmm. In fact, she has been more socialized as a boy uh, than as a little girl, so she doesn't understand their deviousness and hypocrisy. (laughs) When Can you tell us some of the thinking behind Stephen's dying in the way he did, whether it was a random event or why, why you chose to put that well, in like that? Well, the older you get, the more people just die. I mean, it is the most amazing thing. And they, they don't do it often in the way that they do it in, in books, with a nice long build-up and a death scene and everybody gets together and forgives each other and mm. things like that. They just suddenly die. These days, they're more likely to die in random violent events. So is it part of trying to make sense of things and actually not being able to? Well, I I think it's one of those holes in time. Time in the book is not like a railway track. It's very lumpy. And that is, in fact, how we experience time. You can go for days and days with nothing much happening, and then bang, suddenly there's an event and something just falls off a cliff or through the floor, and it just explodes, and... Alas, life is not orderly. Art is an attempt to make order out of it, but it does not by any means always succeed. Given that uh, that view of time is one of the organising principles of the book, let me ask you just to read the very beginning of Chapter 1, which establishes that concept of time and the way it works in the book. This is the very beginning. Time is not a line but a dimension, like the dimensions of space. If you can bend space, you can bend time also. And if you knew enough and could move faster than light, you could travel backwards in time and exist in two places at once. It was my brother Stephen who told me that when he wore his raveling maroon sweater to study in and spent a lot of time standing on his head so that the blood would run down into his brain and nourish it. I didn't understand what he meant, but maybe he didn't explain it very well. He was already moving away from the imprecision of words. But I began then to think of time as having a shape, something you could see, like a series of liquid transparencies, one laid on top of another. 
You don't look back a long time, but down through it like water. Sometimes this comes to the surface, sometimes that, sometimes nothing. Nothing goes away. I was really fascinated how you managed to recall the minute details of childhood so successfully. And I just wondered whether this is something that you've always been able to do or whether you had to do a lot of research into certain aspects of childhood in Canada at that time. I've always been able to do it, but also I do research just to make sure that I'm right. And I, had a, I once had a wonderful employer called Mrs. Mary Sims. She's still alive. In fact, I just went to her 90th birthday party. And she wrote me a letter just recently, because we still write letters, and I still go see her. She's quite wonderful. And she said, I've always suspected that you were nearsighted as a child and astigmatic, she said, because I was. And although cows and trees featured in my childhood landscapes, ants and you know, shells and stones were much, <laughs> much clearer to me. And if you are nearsighted and astigmatic, you do th see things up very close and very, very clearly. You know, I could see the weave on the sheet. I could see the actual threads. Uh, but I wouldn't necessarily be able to see way down the road. And this wasn't discovered until I was 12. So I had a kind of foggy few years there. And uh, it might have something to do with that. And it might have something to do with the Ruskin experience. And... The Ruskin experience was that he was brought up by his mother and not allowed to have any toys. And his toys were the pattern in the carpet and a bunch of keys. I was a child in the, in the 40s when there weren't many toys around. I didn't have many. And we were, you know, up in the woods away from a lot of variety of stimulus. But it means that you do record very clearly the things that are there. So it might have something to do with that. I'm not sure. I was going to ask about um, Stephen, because after those fantastic descriptions of their, their life together, their family life, they're both uprooted and put into this alien environment. And yet Stephen, on the surface, survives, whereas Elaine is, is bullied. And that's what I was, I was guessing at when I said, did, did you think that men or boys are allowed to be unconventional, whereas girls have got to be conventional? This particular book happens to be about... Um, Elaine, mostly. She's the narrator. Stephen, anyway, is, is off in another dimension most of the time. He's a scientist, and scientists seem to be quite well insulated uh, from certain kinds of things that are important to other people, such as what folks think of them. <laughs> and I, I think you're only really vulnerable to that kind of thing that happens to Elaine if you're worried about what people think of you. That's how she's got at. Stephen doesn't care. Right on the first page, he's got a raveling maroon sweater and he's standing on his head. Cat's Eye is also very heavily about place. It describes Canada in the most beautiful terms. But do you th what do you think is more important as an influence, the, the genetic influence of Elaine's family or the environment? Because one might feel that the influence of her parents might have sustained her, whereas, in fact, she wasn't sustained through all her traumas and troubles. But she, she does come out all right. She comes out better than Cordelia does, for instance. But your question is n nature versus nurture. Yes. And uh, we seem to be concluding in our infinite wisdom as a society that it's 50% of each. Are you trying to show that it's easier to forge an identity for women in contemporary Canada than it was, say, back in the, the post-war era of Elaine's girlhood? One thinks, for example, of uh, Mrs. Smith and her very restricted... Uh, domestic ambit of life. Well, Mrs. Smith certainly has an identity. It may not be one you would wish to spend much time around, but you can't <laughs> say she doesn't have one. <laughs> so, I, no, I don't think it's that at all. You know, as I say, Elaine actually comes out fairly well. She uh, survives her experiences. She gets back at Cordelia. She becomes an artist. She's successful at that. What more do you want? It seemed to me that... Um, the Protestant tradition in which the, the, the Smiths move now brought up in was set against some Catholic themes in that um, there's the, the appearance of the Virgin, as she thinks, to Elaine, and there's also her red purse, which reminds me, anyway, of the Sacred Heart. Oh. 
Um, um, That's good. <laughs> um, and, and yet religion then seems to disappear from the second half of the book. Well, it does tend to, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, no, I think it comes back. It's there in the last scene, but it, mm. of course it has, and in, in the scene at the bridge with, with Cordelia, of course it, it does in that childhood way, because that childhood way is very imagistic and based on strange perceptions. Again, like most things in childhood, it's very intense. And why are the Catholic things more alluring? Well, it's because the Protestant ones are so deeply unalluring. <laughs> and at least this is at least this other one has a nice lady in it, which cannot be said of the Smith entourage. Now, this is not a statement about religion. It's a statement about certain images and experiences in a novel. I, I was very struck by the contrast in fates between Cordelia and Elaine. And I wondered whether that was actually because Elaine succeeds in becoming an artist and whether that is, in fact, in a way, her salvation. Well, let's think of Cordelia's family. Cordelia is the youngest of three sisters. The, the two older ones give her a terrible time, which she then passes on to Elaine. And uh, she also has a fairly uh, verbally violent, anyway, father. I mean, she is not having a happy home life. And... Mm -hmm. It is often so, if you observe these groups of little girls, and I was a summer camp counselor, and I had a Saturday morning group, and I had a daughter, and I taught in schools and all the rest of it. I had a hard look at them. But the one doing the bullying is actually the one who's having a bad time at home. The bullying is a way of acting out and getting some power back. But there's some cracks in the armor underneath all of, all of that. In fact, Steve, Stephen's death fits into that pattern, doesn't it? Because a lot of people in, in the book are suffering from other people's unhappiness, and he is yes. actually shot. Yes, because of that. It gets passed around. And people indeed like very much to pass it around. Can I ask you something that struck me, which is not as profound a question as some of the ones we've just had? How did you tumble on the idea of the cat's eye itself, the marble, as the kind of prism? through which all this was going to flow, because it's a wonderful physical centre for all these sort of emotions that are whirling around in the book. You can almost see it sort of, you know, as a kind of backward crystal ball. Up until about, I think, 1965, there was a, a, a childhood culture which I think had remained more or less permanent and more or less passed on from children to children to children for many generations and it involved games and songs and things that were done on the playground and sayings and part of this culture was marbles and they were highly desirable objects it was considered very bad form to actually buy any you were supposed to win them and it was something that girls and boys could both play and you could both be good at and you could then become quite high on the totem pole if you had got hold of everybody else's uh, marbles, especially the valuable ones. And the cat's eye was not the most valuable one, but I would say it was the second. So there was this commerce going on amongst children that adults really didn't have much to do with. And so I was familiar with marbles, and I was very keen on them. I wasn't very good at it, but I was very keen on them. So it was a natural kind of object for me. The cat's eye in England also means the things that go down the middle of the road to show the way. So I like that. They light up in the dark. We don't have them in Canada because you can't have them with frost. They just pop out of the road. So I like that. And for the artist, of course, it's the third eye. We've all wondered if, if when you were writing it, you had a, a picture of the fully formed Cordelia, you know, the adult Cordelia and where she'd gone. Um, obviously, you know, the reconciliation works really well. For well, Elaine I think Cordelia it. is dead. Do you? Yeah. Why? Why? Well, because I th <laughs> that's just what I think. That's just my okay. own opinion. Yeah. Uh, there are con you there are her. Sorry. You're in control of this universe. <laughs> Come like, on. We, we worried about her. <laughs> yeah, well, there, I would. You know, she's yeah. a worrisome person. Yeah. One ought to worry about her. But there are pseudo-Cordelias that appear in each of the now sections. Elaine keeps bumping into people that yeah. might be mm -hmm. Cordelia, or they whisk round the corner and they're not mm -hmm. Cordelia, or they're a bag lady and they might be Cordelia, but they aren't. So she's expecting to come upon Cordelia at any moment, but she doesn't. And the fact that she doesn't come upon the real, real Cordelia indicates to me that 
Cordelia is now, as my friend in California says, on another plane of existence. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you think she could have forgiven her? If she, she has actually forgiven. Met her? She has forgiven her by the end of the book. Oh, I know she forgave, but if, I mean, if she actually met her physically, oh, I do you think, think she would she forgive her then as well. Good. Oh, thanks. You make me feel better. <laughs> How do you feel when you hear people discussing these characters as people with feelings, with pasts, with futures, um, when you have to think of an answer, but you've created the universe in which they move and every feeling they have? Well, I suppose I feel deeply pleased. An author's honest statement, which is a very happy moment um, at which to end. Thank you very much, Margaret Atwood, for being our guest on Book Club this month. Thank you all at home for joining this month's readers in the studio, who include students from the Highcliffe Comprehensive in Dorset, for our discussion about Cat's Eye, which I do hope you enjoyed. Next month, another treat. We're going to read Snow Falling on Cedars by David Gutterson. It's a thriller and, in a way, an elegy, a real story. And we'll talk about that on Book Club on the first Sunday of June. That's the 6th of June at the usual time of 4 o'clock. Now, remember, if you want to join us here, you can write to us at Book Club, BBC Broadcasting House, London W1A1AA, or you can send us an email at bookclub at bbc.co.uk. We do enjoy hearing from you. Keep them coming. So with our thanks to Margaret Atwood and to all of you, until next month and the next book, goodbye. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes at bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.